Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast, where we talk with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community. Today, we have Jenna Fessmeyer, who is on her way to Boston. Boston will be Monday, the 18th of April. For those of you who don't know, that is Patriots Day. I come from Massachusetts, so I know that it is Patriots Day. Jenna is a, was a Paralympian in Tokyo. She is generally in the front of the pack, front of the races in marathons and they have it major marathons. And this will be, I assume, your first race of the year, right, Jenna? Yes, this is my first. Um, thank you so much for having me this evening. And uh, yeah, my first marathon of the year. So all those butterflies are coming back, but we're excited to get everything rolling. How is this transition for you? Boston is one of those races that everybody looks at and goes, oh, it's a spectacular race. And it can be anything from 80 degrees to negative 10 to, you know, beautiful sunshine to freezing rain. And how do you prepare for this kind of a race, especially coming out of winter? Absolutely. You know, uh, I train here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, the U.S. Paralympic training site for wheelchair athletes. And so um, being coached under uh, Adam Blakeney, he, he really has been setting us out in all conditions. And so this morning we were having a good laugh because we arrived at the track and it just started downpouring. And so we kind of looked around and we were looking to see if the workout was going to shorten and uh, coach sent us all the way through. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're ready and uh, that's why we do it, right? And just being able to prepare for any condition that Boston might offer on Monday. And so I'm feeling pretty confident in that aspect of, you know, rain or shine, headwind or tailwind, uh, we're ready for Boston. And so we're getting excited. What was it like for you coming off of Tokyo? Tokyo being your first Paralympic games, there's a huge build to that. Then you had the five major marathons, five of the six last fall. So this was, that was a huge year for you. And then you come in and then, then you're starting over again. What, how, how is your mind, uh, how has your point of view shifted, I guess? Oh my gosh. Well, last fall was such a whirlwind, you know, training for my first Paralympic games, competing at my first Paralympic games, and then coming back and having uh, the rest of the world Abbott marathon majors uh, at the tail end. Uh, so at the end of 2020, 2021, I was pretty burnt out and uh, ready to, to take it easy. And at that point, we were at our roller season. And so uh, mentally, I was able to transition to a little bit more of a quiet time of year for wheelchair athletes where you're completely indoors, you're able to focus on the biomechanics, the biomechanics of the sport, and uh, just gear up for the next year. And so I was really thankful for that time to be able to uh, recenter my focus. And so for this year, you know, I'm really excited that Boston isn't 24 hours after Chicago Marathon. <laughs> and so that's something that I'm taking with so much gratitude this year, but I'm going in with a new focus and just being able to celebrate a normal race year, right? All of the race dates are mostly back to normal. You'll see London uh, back in the fall again, but it's nice to kind of take that uh, deep breath of knowing that you're, you're going back to your normal schedule and you're going to be able to celebrate it with each and every race community in its fullness. That is awesome just for your state of mind. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, okay, now I actually can sort yeah. of be normal. And as you said, I mean, last year, the marathons went, what, Berlin, like the 27th of September, then yeah. London a week later, Chicago a week later, Boston a day later, and then New York obviously was easy because you had a month in between. Right. How much did you learn from that stuff that then you took to your roller season where you were refining who you are, what you're trying to do, all of those things. Yeah, you know, I, I, it was such a whirlwind. That's the best way that I can describe it. You know, I have never competed at such a high volume before, you know, and having the, the Tokyo Paralympics, the, the biggest race of your life at the forefront of all of that was really, I, I kind of felt like a deer in the headlights of just, oh my gosh, it's happening. And 
you have to trust that you did the training at the front front part of 2021 and you have to trust uh coach adam and 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 know that you did everything that you could to prepare physically for the race and so the hardest part was perhaps mentally of being able to all right we have you know five marathons this year and we're just going to take it one at a time you can't look at the big picture you kind of just have to focus on the process and so that's something that I'm challenging myself with this year of, all right, let's just continue to enjoy the process for what it is. Enjoy being a wheelchair athlete and just take it one marathon at a time. Now you got into wheelchair racing back when you were in high school, really. How did, yeah. how did this end up? And, and interesting as well, for those people who, who are out there. So, so Jenna is a triplet and also has a teammate who is a triplet. Brian, Brian Siemens, a triplet as well, right? Is it two of you or is there another one too? No, I think Brian's a quadruplet. He has me beat. Quadruplet? Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to sell him short. Please tell him I I didn't mean to sell him short. And he has three sisters. So that's like super awesome. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, he has me beat, but yeah, we're multiples. Yeah. How did this work that you ended up getting into wheelchair racing? Because, because you are an above the knee amputee. And so, and which is interesting in Boston, because there's, there's now a a, a para class, a a para athlete class, which are visually impaired and, and as they call it in the IPC limb deficiencies, right? Mm -hmm. So, so people who are amputees, whether, whether legs or arms or whatever it is, but you being an amputee are, are a wheelchair racer. How did that end up working out? Yeah, so I was born with a congenital birth defect called proximal femoral focal deficiency. And so it's really tough to say, try to say it five times fast for a little challenge. But essentially what it means is that when I was born, my left leg didn't grow and I was born without a hip joint. And so you'll you'll see um, when I walk, I have a little bit of a, a dip to the left. And it's just because my, my left hip doesn't have that structural support to walk as efficiently as my other amputee pals. And so, you know, when I was in high school, I had to make the decision of, am I going to run in a blade or am I going to uh, be in a racing wheelchair? And um, other than, you know, re- wheelchair racing, just completely uh, capturing my heart, just with the feeling of going fast, uh, the biomechanics of the sport and all of those different things. I knew that um, there could be a little bit of uh, a jeopardy in terms of longevity if I were to choose to run on a blade. And so I wanted to protect my left side as much as possible. Um, And so that also factored into my decision of being a wheelchair athlete. And and the blade that you're talking about is, uh, so so it's a prosthetic and they call it a racing blade where it's, it's a carbon fiber, basically like J looking kind of blade that that then replicates the running motion and you as an above the knee amputee would either have have a knee joint or or you might not have a knee joint we actually talked to melissa stockwell not too long ago and she does not use a knee joint and does sort of a circular kind of thing you would have also either been a sprinter if you had been running on a blade versus being more of a long distance and in in Tokyo, you did 1500, 5k and the marathon. Are you more set up as a distance person or is that just the way that you've adapted? Yeah. Well, you know, um, just to back up for a minute, that is, that is such a a funny thing that you brought that up because, you know, if I were to choose to, uh, run with the blade, uh, the IPC currently only offers, uh, two events for track and fields for above the knee amputees. And so that's a 100 meter and the long jump versus wheelchair racing, where they offer really a plethora of events from the 100 meter up to the marathon. And so that is most definitely something that contributed to my decision for wheelchair racing. Um, But, you know, to answer your question about long distance events, I started as a sprinter when I arrived to Illinois. I remember uh, you being at practice with us and uh, you were uh, helping us on the track. And, uh, you know, I try, I, I decided to try a marathon. I kind of heard that Adam's long distance, uh, marathon training was, you know, would benefit all athletes. And so, uh, I figured, you know, I want to get better. And so I might as well give it a try. And, uh, once I did my first marathon in 2016, it was the Chicago marathon. Uh, 
I fell in love with the challenge. Uh, and this sport can be so humiliating uh, uh, and so humbling, I should say as well. Uh, and so I just, I just wanted to continue to um, challenge myself and humble myself uh, within the sport. And so that's kind of how I started in marathons. Um, and here I am now, I think I've probably run over 50 marathons in my time. Have you really? And that's, yeah. it's, 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 is it good peer pressure? How does this work? When you're at the <laughs> University of Illinois, you become a marathoner, right? Yeah. Um, Adam's probably going to be listening to this. So I'm going to say it's good peer pressure. No, I, yeah, it is. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's what we do. Um, you know, science, the science continues to prove that um, the more time you spend in a racing wheelchair, the more time you get to refine the movement and ultimately uh, become better over time. And so I, I really had to challenge myself to put in the time over the past seven years here at Illinois. And uh, ultimately it paid off last year at the games and we have a long way to go, um, but it's just affording yourself the time on the road, uh, in the, on the track and within marathons as well uh, to be able to refine the movement in the sport. And we're talking specifically about wheelchair racing, but you are a problem solver mm. as well, aren't you? I mean, you were you were varsity golfer in high school. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I, I my temper wasn't uh, suitable for golf. I would say <laughs> a little I, too fiery. Yeah, you know, I had to learn some patience over time. Uh, but yeah, it was great. I was a varsity athlete all four years. Uh, I love the sport of golf. I still golf to this day. And so I do attribute maybe a little bit more of my uh, evened out uh, fiery attitude to uh, to golf. Just a little bit. I got a little bit better. Not a lot. <laughs> well, this you can get fiery in wheelchair racing, but sometimes that comes back to really haunt you. I mean, golf, you might you might end up with a couple more strokes than you had planned, but in this, you could, if you get really fired up, you could go completely out of your, out of your race plan and end up really paying for it. Yeah. You know, this, this sport really has taught me to focus on the process and just be mindful and just be mindful because you can't control what happened in the back half of the race, but you can control what has happened in, you know, in the next 13 miles or whatever it will be. And so um, just trying to keep an optimistic attitude within, within those things. And it's a process and I'm still learning. I uh, still have a long way to go, but I think I'm heading in the right direction. You are a big picture kind of person though, aren't you? I mean, the, the idea of being mindful what is what is sort of the bigger picture that you're trying to do? Obviously, wheelchair racing is part of your vehicle, but what's the message that you're trying to spread? Yeah, you know, and I think uh, Wazel has helped me. My sponsor has helped me with a lot of this as well. It's just uh, creating a foundation for uh, education and advocacy within the sport. And so we have a long way to go when it comes to um filling the gaps with uh, disability and sport and sport and disabled sport and society. And so um, I'm really trying to um, work to create a space uh, to create access and to continue to create access for um, young boys and girls to have uh, equipment within sport, um, to educate our society about um, disabled sport. And so uh, a lot of the work that I do with Wazelle now is um, creating a space to talk about those things and uh, to let folks know it's okay to ask questions and uh, it's okay to be curious and to move forward with that attitude. What's yeah. the best question that you've ever been asked if it's okay to oh. ask questions? Oh man. Um, you know, I feel like I always receive the same types of questions. Um, very like, I, there's like the what happened questions. Does it hurt when you walk? questions um how do you put your leg on and so in my instagram my most recent instagram post um i i show um my followers how to put on my prosthetic leg and every prosthetic leg is different but just some of those more foundational things and so just creating a, a, a space to have a conversation and to let folks know that i'm ready to talk and uh also ready to listen what's the question that they should ask 
What, what, what do you have that people need to know? Yeah. Um, how can I help my community uh, create a space for disabled sport? And what, is that, what does that look like? I think that's a really good question. Uh, how can I help you know, my own community? And so they can just start right where they are and start those questions there. Um, and then I think that that'll make a, a big difference in the long run. And so I think that's, that'd be a really great question to start. Which is an interesting question too, right? Because you're talking about this is a question for, with regard to disabled sport, with, but, but yeah. it's a question for all of us in so many different ways. How do I fit into my community? How can yeah. I support my community? How can I support those who might not necessarily have a voice in my community? It, it, is that universal kind of message the thing that, that resonates with people? Or how, how do you get them to see you for who you are and see themselves for who they are? Yeah, I think it's, it's just being authentic and um, being open and inviting and, and warm and welcoming in that way. Um, because I'm a human too. And I use, I use a big block of metal to, to walk, but I think that we do have a lot of parallels, whether we're um, able-bodied or disabled. And so I think that folks can continue to see themselves and me if, if I can meet them where they are and they can meet me where I'm at. And so um, that's how I start, yeah. And you mentioned Wazell, what is, what is Wazell? And are you, mm -hmm. one, are you the only sponsored athlete? Are you part of a group of sponsored athletes? Are there more Paralympic athletes? How does that work? Yeah, Wazell is a uh, women run and women supported apparel company for runners specifically. And so Wazell is based out of Seattle, Washington. And actually we're celebrating our 15th birthday, uh, Wazell. And so we're, we're celebrating over this, the course of this week. And so uh, Wazell does a really great job with advocacy, um, with asking hard questions when it comes to women's running. And uh, I met Wazell three years ago and I'm in love with their mission, right? I wanna ask hard questions too. And, and mine's within uh, disabled sport. And so uh, we met at Grandma's Marathon in 2019 and, and found out that our vision is very similar. And so we've been running together ever since then. And so it's myself and then one other professional athlete. And they have an athlete advisor team that supports us as well. And so we're able to have our professional career being an athlete, but also working on that advocacy, educating, um, all of those different things as well, because those things complement each other really well. And so um, we have a lot of really great things coming up this year. And so I feel very honored to be Wazell's wheelchair athlete. And um, yeah, I'm just trying to learn how to use my voice within that. And uh, thankful to Wazell for giving me space to do that. What do they do differently as far as their clothing is concerned? What's their unique part there? They listen. They listen to all different body types. And uh, it's it's women who are making the products. So a lot of different apparel companies, uh, men are on the front lines and creating uh, the different app apparel. And so um, women are testing out the products, giving their you know, crucial feedback and going back to the drawing board over and over again to create a product that women love and that um, women feel supported with as they run. And it sounds like it's it's been great for you. I mean, you said you never took off their their tights basically from the time you put them on, on right? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm wearing them right now. Uh, actually, I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> yeah. What are you expecting as you're approaching Boston? Can you have any expectations since you haven't really raced, or how how does your what's your mindset? Yeah, you know, I um, I. I keep on thinking back to Boston 2021 and I was so tired uh, coming in late from Chicago the night before and feeling low on my nutrition and just depleted, uh, you know, physically, uh, mentally. 
And so um, this year I'm, I'm really trying to dial in on, on my nutrition this week leading up to the race. Um, also just, I'm spending the weekend uh, with Wazelle and with Brooks and trying to uh, soak up the energy of Boston and really use that on race day as well. Uh, usually I, I'm the athlete that sneaks in right before the race and then leaves right after the race. And so I'm trying a different technique this year where I can stay a couple of days before and after. And so, yeah, just have fun, challenge my body, uh, lean into the pain that the second half of the race has to offer and, uh, and celebrate at the end. And, and to back up a little bit for you as well in Chicago, Chicago and Boston were back to back separated by not even a day yeah. really I mean just less than 24 hours yeah and you had a great race in Chicago you were third in Chicago went 150 in Chicago so there was a reason why you might have been a little bit tired than hopped on an airplane and flew to uh, flew to Boston what do you do well like you look at a course like Boston and there's so many mm -hmm. distinctive parts of Boston what do you do well and what might you be able to take advantage of on that course yeah, if there, if we had a wheelchair racing portfolio and, and I had a line that said my strengths, I think my strengths would be, um, you know, that first downhill is going to be really fast for me. Um, I really excel uh, on the crest and on the downhills. I'm, I'm able to, to really hold a nice speed and, and lock in even on the, the flats as well. And so, and, and, you know, to compliment, compliment myself on, on my mindset as well. And just this uh, perseverance, never give up attitude. Um, because I think that that last part really trumps any other physical strength that, that a wheelchair racer could have. And so I'm going to try to lean into that this weekend. And so I'm going to optimize on that first half of Boston. And then I'm going to lean into that pain. I feel in the second half when the, when we start to get those, that series of hills. And so. Uh, that's a little bit of my, my strategy and a tailwind would be nice too. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that works, right? The tailwind uh, and, and hopefully no rain would be nice, but it is springtime in Boston. So nobody knows exactly yeah. what is going to happen. Exactly. In Boston. Yeah. What about some of the other stuff? I mean, if you, uh, I'm looking at your, your Wazelle uh, uh, page, and, and you said your superpower is positivity. What does that mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, just give it a smile and uh, replace can't with maybe I can do this instead. You know, maybe I can do this. And so, uh, yeah, just replacing some of those uh, not so good or negative thought patterns uh, to some positive ones and, uh, I think just keeping a big smile on helps some of that too. And so, yeah, not thinking too much into it and just go out and have fun and celebrate wheelchair racing for what it is and celebrate the, the opportunity to, to move. Yeah. Has that always been the case for you or is that something that you had to learn? I think that's something I've always known, but I think as I've matured over time, it's been easier to implement. For example, you know, coming as, as a freshman to the University of Illinois, you're with the best wheelchair athletes in the world. Uh, and I don't want to name any names because I hate leaving out folks, um, but they're the best athletes in the world. And I would go to practice and I would do, it, do the best that I could, but I'm at the bottom of the totem pole now, right? You go from high school being the top of the totem pole, the best athlete in the state, and then you go to almost essentially the, the elite level, you kind of skip this collegiate level in wheelchair racing. And so um, that was a big wake up call for me. And I had a lot of tough conversations with myself about mentality and um, just the pursuit of mindfulness as I'm wheelchair racing. And so, um, like I said, I still have a long way to go, but I think we're starting to move in the right direction. And I would hope coach Adam Blakeney would say so as well. <laughs> so, so you did that yourself then? You, you were the one who kind of took control of the situation. Because as you said, you went yeah. from, from being a high schooler in, in Ohio, and there probably weren't a whole lot of athletes that you were competing against and probably not a lot that you were competing against on your team. Like at training Correct. during the day or during the week, it's probably just you, right? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you're on the track with not only the best collegiate athletes, 
not only the best athletes in the world, but also some of the best athletes in history. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a transition. How did that, did you take that initiative to say, okay, I've got to create a mindset that is going to be positive for me so that I can survive and thrive in this situation? You know, I'm going to be honest. I I had a lot of help, um, you know, and uh, first it was me being honest with myself of, okay, we cannot keep on going to practice like this. You know, this is miserable for me. It's miserable for uh, coach Adam and and for this, you know, for the rest of the team to be around. And so um, I remember having a hard conversation with coach Adam in his office and saying that something has to change. Like I have to change my mentality somehow. And so he handed me this book called the pursuit of excellence. And I can't remember the author Um, but I know that's a book that he, he hands out to, to athletes as they struggle. And, uh, that was kind of the, the tipping point of, uh, you know, my, my, my shift and how I arrange practice in my mind, how I arrange competitions in my mind and how I arrange wheelchair racing in my mind. And so, uh, that was really the start of it. And I think that was probably halfway through my undergraduate career. How many times did you read the book? And, and it looks like Ryan Hawk yeah. is the author of that The Pursuit right. of Excellence. Yeah, I think twice through. It's a pretty hefty book. You you get it and it's, you know, I, I bought it online and received it. And it's all, it, it feels like it's a book I could take the class with me. It's not just your your normal size book. And so um, I've, I've read it through twice, but I've, I've definitely picked it up and studied it quite a bit along the way. And early on, undergrad, you studied kinesiology. How much of wheelchair racing was your education as well? Yeah, uh, you know, I think it's it's crucial for students to take what they learn in the classroom and to be able to apply it. And so, a lot of times at practice, I was thinking about the the movement of wheelchair racing and oftentimes thinking back to what I just learned in class the the day before. And so I actually did take a biomechanics class uh, with Dr. Ian Rice, who was a wheelchair athlete at the University of Illinois. And so um, he he had modules about wheelchair racing. And so that was really great to see uh, wheelchair racing in the classroom. And of course, even better for me, as I was trying to learn the sport outside of the classroom. And so that was a fun little parallel there. But thing, and things are a little bit different from you because the vast majority, like Ian, who is a contemporary of mine, uh, is a quadriplegic. I'm a paraplegic. Mm-hmm. So we have the benefit in some ways of not being able to fear, feel our legs as we're in this contorted yogi kind of position trying to go for hours and hours on end. But you actually feel your leg because you have full sensation throughout your throughout your leg. How much is is that different, and how did you have to approach that pr- approach the sport differently? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of chair tolerance involved, a lot of time just spending it out on the road, uh, making it through those uh, uncomfortable spurts of of climbs and long miles and all of those things. And so, actually, the way that I, I sit in my racing wheelchair is is different than the majority of other wheelchair athletes out there. And so there are two um, seating positions that you typically see. And so the first one is a kneeling position. And that's the position that you were just talking about of having uh, the athlete's legs completely underneath them. Um, It creates a little bit more of an aerodynamic uh, approach for the athlete, but also the biomechanics um, some would argue would be a little bit more optimal there as well. And just with shoulder and arm positioning. And so, but for me, um, it's quite honestly, just, it's been so hard for me to, to learn to sit in that position. And so I am in a seated position where my right leg sits right out in front of me on top of a foot plate. And so for me, my, my right leg kind of has an isometric hold during a marathon and just helping me, um, yeah, it just help, helps me with my biomechanics and staying locked in there. And uh, eventually I'm really gonna challenge myself to get to that kneeling position. And I tried it a little bit this winter, but ultimately it just wasn't the right time. And so uh, that's something I'm navigating as well. 
Right. So you contend with some other things that other athletes do not contend with, where right. we're talking about arms mm -hmm. and shoulders and back being sore. But then for you, you're talking about like your hamstring being sore or whatever, your, your yeah. leg cramping. Yeah, it's my hamstring. It's my hip. It's my glute. Um, and so sometimes if I get a nice downhill, I'll, I'll straighten out my leg and stretch it out a little bit. Uh, and so that helps a little bit, but, uh, yeah, there's no way around it. It's, it is a, a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Do you have any expectations looking at some of the other athletes who are entering the race this mm -hmm. year, how the race might go? I mean, I'm sure you've talked to Adam, you don't, we don't need to give away state secrets or anything by any means, but, uh, what, what are your expectations and what, I mean, especially like that start, you said you go downhill well. Yeah. And then you have Manuela who goes downhill well as well. Does that kind of jumpstart your race? Yeah, Boston's back, Chris. Oh my gosh, we are going to have an awesome field of women athletes. Uh, you know, COVID is starting to lighten up quite a bit. And so some of our international folks are starting to make their way in for Boston. And so we're going to have a strong race all the way through. We're going to have a, a really quick first downhill and so, uh, you know, my goal is to, to tuck and go, let it rip and uh, let that carry me through and, and also see what I can do in the back end as well. And really kind of try to um, use my strengths that I'll have in the first half to, to, give, to give me a little bit more energy to really dig in, in that second half. And so, uh, yeah, first, I feel like this is the first race fully back, uh, since, uh, before the pandemic. And so there's a lot of energy around that. There's a lot of energy around that. There's usually a lot of energy lining the course as well. How much do the fans help you as you're going through 26.2 miles? You know, every marathon is, is really unbelievable how, um, family members throw, show up friends, community members, but Boston is really special. Uh, it's really special. I don't think there's a quiet moment on that course. And especially as you're finishing out the race, uh, you, you really can't hear yourself think, Chris, because uh, you know all of the, the noise and the energy, the yelling around you. And so that most definitely contributes to the athletes' performances and being able to um, you know, push through and uh, experience the fullness of the community. What does this year look like? So you're starting at Boston. Mm -hmm. You have, I'm, I'm assuming that Paris in 2024, which is not four years away, but is three years away or less than three years away now. Uh, what does what your year look like? And what is your sort of game plan approaching Paris looking like? Yeah, I'm back to a high volume of races this year. Uh, you know, I think Boston kicking us off. I think I'm at a race almost every weekend until the middle of July. And so some notable races are the Peachtree 10K uh, on 4th of July, uh, Grandma's Marathon at the end of June. Um, I'll be in, in New York City for the Women's Mini 10K at the beginning of June. And then, of course, the IPC Grand Prix Swiss series uh, at the end of May. Uh, so we have a full schedule of races. So I'm, I'm really just trying to get back into the routine. And, you know, this winter I experienced kind of a, a little bit of a dip of just being tired from 2021. And so now that I've kind of taken this, I won't call it an off season because we didn't take any time off, but we took some time indoors, uh, you know, taking some time indoors and being able to reshift shift my focus I'm really just so thrilled to be racing this year. And I'm just going to take it a, a race at a time. And that's something you mentioned your races. That's a little bit different for wheelchair athletes than it is for some of the runners where you're going back and forth between being on the track, doing 10 Ks, doing marathons. I mean, wide variety of different distances. Do you enjoy that kind of variety? I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, I love, I love wheelchair racing right now. Uh, you know, I, I just purely love the, the sport for, for what it is and, uh, how it makes me feel and, and who it's, it's 
creating me to be right that you know I've, I've been using wheelchair racing as a way of developing my voice and all of the things that we talked about earlier and so I love the variety because it plays to some of the athletes different strengths but uh it also kind of helps me round out as an athlete over time and so uh some of those shorter distances are 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 leaning to be maybe not my strength. And so working on my sprints and hill climbs and all those different things, uh, all of that can be accomplished during a race and being able to tune into those different aspects. Do you, uh, looking on the radar too, is, is Paris on the radar? Are, are, you, are you looking and building toward that or, or is it not on the radar right now? I think that, you know, you asked me about my most frequently asked question. I think that is my most frequently asked question. So um, taking it a year at a time. Uh, and, you know, right now my, my sights are set on Paris. And so uh, a little personal thing about me, I just accepted uh, admission into a doctoral program here at the University of Illinois. And so I will most certainly be around in training and so um, I don't think it's too, too far off to say that Paris will be uh, in my sights. Does that get to be more and more of a challenge the further you go academically to be able to balance the two? You know, I think that being an athlete and being a student complement each other very well. And so I told myself many years ago that if I wanted to be an athlete and continue to be an athlete, I needed to pair it with being a student and vice versa. I think that both of those things really do complement each other well. Um, I've seen great success in, in both facets and, and being able to enjoy both. And so it's no secret that pursuing a PhD is going to offer a whole new gauntlet of, of challenges, but I'm ready to take them head on and, and see uh, what happens with wheelchair racing along the way. That sounds awesome. I mean, it's a nice way to complement things, I'm sure. Uh, you know, good balance that that you're doing something physical, then you're doing something mental, and not that not the racing isn't mental as well, but but sometimes maybe in the training you can turn your mind off a little bit and give yourself a little bit of a break from all of the heavy thinking you've been doing. Do you ever take any of your wheelchair racing competitors out on the golf course? Oh my gosh, that is a good question. I don't think I have. I don't really? think I have. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know we've talked about it, I, but I don't think we've actually uh, followed through with the execution. So maybe this summer, um, come mid-July, when our, our schedules slow down a bit, I would love to take them out on the golf course. Are you going to start them with like mini golf and then bring them to a real golf course or how would that work? <laughs> yeah, I think we'd have to start with maybe a little bit of putt-putt and then uh, we can work our way up. <laughs> yeah are you looking at any of them thinking okay they could be pretty good golfers yeah you know uh I see a couple of long wingspans on the the team of Illinois and so I think that helps too uh with some of the golf biomechanics and so uh yeah I think that we can make it happen <laughs> well Jenna this is this is awesome I mean I thank you so much for joining us and wishing you great luck because what this is Wednesday and and you have five days before yeah. Boston will you arrive do you fly tomorrow I fly on Friday uh, and then I leave on Tuesday and so um, you know for any of our listeners if you want to connect I'm happy to connect and uh, I'm ready to soak up everything that Boston has to offer what's the what's the coffee go to for race day, do you have a specific coffee go to? Because you are a big coffee drinker, right? Yes. So I I do have a new sponsor, uh, Runners High Coffee, and so I will be bringing some Runners High Coffee to Boston. And so shout out to any of my listeners if they want to give it a try. But that is uh, by far my my favorite coffee, and you know I won't be messing around with my coffee choices come race day. And, and so how are you doing that? Is this instant coffee? Do you have a French press? This is an aero, yeah, it's an aero press. Yeah. And so uh, you got to be a little bit creative, but uh, yeah, I'll bring an aero press and my, my bag of grounds here and 
uh, yeah, hotel, hot water, uh, and we'll, we'll make it work. Can you talk us through just, just quickly, since we're talking about coffee, like how does the race day of Boston work? When are you waking up all of that? Yeah, I think Boston Marathon has a, a later start time of 8.30, I believe, if I, if I read that correctly. Um, and so we'll get up quite early. Um, and so there is a little bit of travel time uh, getting to the race start because Boston is pretty much a point-to-point -point race. And so um, we'll probably wake up around four or so, I will imagine, um, get up and have breakfast at the hotel, have my runner's high coffee, um, do your last equipment check and make sure everything is set before you say goodbye to Coach Adam at the hotel. And then uh, hop on the bus and get to the start line, warm up and, and off you go. Exactly. I mean, you have to do basically your 26.2 in reverse from the hotel to the start out in Hopkinton, hang out at the at the school there and then and then get get going and hope that yeah. it's nice weather and that it's not too cold hanging out at the start line. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah, you know, I think 2018 was a really cold and rainy year. And so uh, I was on the injured list that year, so I got to uh, skip that one, but uh, you never know what you'll expect for Boston. And so uh, you bring it all, right? You bring your, your tank top for the nice day, you bring your uh, trash bag or your raincoat for the rainy day and uh, expect the unexpected. The beauty though is regardless of what the weather's like, the course will be lined and people will be cheering for you the whole way. Absolutely. Yep. You can expect that. Yes. Jenna, thank you so much for, for joining us, but for what you're doing for the sport, what you're doing for the community and, and just having fun and, and bringing a smile to what you do. Thank you for having me, Chris, and letting me share my story. Um, thank you for everyone who's been listening. I'd love to connect with you and Boston Marathon. Here we come. Here we come. I will see you in Boston on Friday. So I am looking forward to it. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining us. The greatest gift you can give us is to tell your friends. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please tell your friends to tune in. Please like us. Please follow us. And this will also be produced as a traditional podcast. It will be wherever you find your podcast. So go tune back in or share it with your friends and we will see you for the next one. Thanks a lot. Take care.